All right. Welcome, everyone, to our Mental Health Matters, the Era of Empathetic Entrepreneurship. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, hosting you with my co-facilitators today, Salima and Dylan, who you'll learn more about very soon. Um, but we have an hour together. Feel comfortable. This is about well-being, so we want to make sure that you feel um, able to be yourselves in today's, um, in today's meeting. And if there's anything, uh, please feel free to reach out to us through the chat. Um, but I'll get right into it. If I could have the first slide go up or a second slide as I speak through, um, firstly, an introduction and then take you through what the agenda will look like for today. All right. So my name is Safia Abji. I am a trauma-informed coach and a well-being consultant based in Nairobi, Kenya. And my organization focuses on a human-centered approach to creating systems of work and how our values align with the work that we do. I founded my business almost three years ago, but have been based in Kenya for about eight years. And although I was trained as a coach almost a decade ago, most of my coaching work was pro bono until I started my full-time practice. So during my time in Kenya, I worked for international NGOs and after many years with, within the management consulting industry um, in Canada. While in the development sector, and some of you may resonate with this, I worked with many youth in the economic inclusion space. And I'm actually a longtime friend and advocate for the Sand Kelp Summit as I've worked very closely with a number of entrepreneurs across East Africa. What I recognized during this time was that there's a gap between creating jobs and opportunities for young people and their diverse realities at home. In development work, there's often little consideration of the impacts of cultural and personal challenges that can create barriers to employment. From gender inequities to financial challenges to access to technology and mentorship opportunities to stigma towards the geography that they live in and little understanding or investment on issues of mental health and needs in general, I was often getting asked for support as a coach first by my beneficiaries rather than for vocational training and employment support. The truth is that no matter where you come from, when you don't have the appropriate systems to support you as a whole human being, you only bring part of you to the job. This is an unsustainable and potentially destructive approach to economic conclusion interventions, as we are often supporting those who are looking for work to strengthen their sense of confidence and see it as a pathway to meaningful work. Sorry, guys. And so, uh, to meaningful work and growth. So as a result, I started my coaching practice and consulting business to focus on the systems we have in place already and how to be more inclusive in the solutions we create, not only focus on the bottom line, but actually those who contribute to it. I wanted to facilitate this session to put a spotlight on the topic of well-being in the workplace because as much as this is being spoken about on the outside, especially since the impact of the pandemic, we are still not having important conversations within the spaces where transformation is possible and very required. Today, we'll provide a small taste of why we need to start scaling these conversations and create cultural shifts rather than a bandaged solution to rising issues of mental and emotional well-being. Now, thank you so much for listening to that. Before I move forward, I wanted to take you through uh, slide two, which is the agenda, so you know kind of what the flow of today will look like. Now, our flow will be very fluid. Um, we have opportunities for Q&A at the end. So if you are, um, if we have a really, a lot of questions and we're having a great conversation, um, we are happy to continue that moving forward. But also to let you know, we have a bit of a brainstorming exercise at the end to start thinking about workplace well-being. So uh, once we're done with introductions today, we'll go into an icebreaker. We'll talk uh, more about why well-being is becoming a priority in the workplace. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about your own personal well-being um, and assess that. Uh, and then we'll hear from Salima and Dylan um, on their own entrepreneurial journeys and why well-being has become important for them, um, as well as do some speaker Q&A, and at which point we'll do a bit of brainstorming around how to uh, improve the culture of well-being in your workplace. All right, let me hand it over to Salima for introductions, and thank you all so, so much. Hi, everyone. Nice to see everyone here. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Thanks, Safia, for the lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Salima Balani, and I'm a nine times founder. Some failed, some exited. Lots of my story we're going to share soon. Uh, a TEDx speaker and the best selling award winning author of this baby, this book, Innovation Starts with I, recently launched in November 2021. 
Uh, I'm also the founder and CEO of Ripple Impact, which is a business accelerator that helps entrepreneurs grow their businesses and scale their platform. So essentially, we're the team behind the scenes to many entrepreneurs, helping them grow and scale their businesses. I also teach design thinking and entrepreneurship at Johns Hopkins University at the school, the Graduate School for International Studies, and I often guest lecture at business schools. I'm also currently a student myself in the lead uh, executive education program at Stanford University's uh, Graduate School of Business. I contribute to Forbes. I talk a lot about innovation, entrepreneurship, remote team building, and I've been published in 15 different research publications between the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, I have a previous career in international development, which is very much aligned with what I'm doing today, since we do work with entrepreneurs all over the world, especially in emerging markets. And I've done a lot of work on how to promote um, a circular economy and improve refugee livelihoods using hydroponics and water saving climate smart technologies. And uh, I've done a lot with that in, in the MENA region, including insect farming, which is a new thing I've been up to. Uh, and why the session is important to me. So mental health has been a really important part of my own entrepreneurship journey. And it, it actually helped with the unleashing process since a lot of us have to go through some sort of unleashing and coming out of the, the closet when it comes to, you know, finding ourselves or becoming ourselves as entrepreneurs, these new versions of ourselves. And I, I really resonate with the, the James Clear quote, which is entrepreneurship is a personal growth engine disguised as a business pursuit. Uh, there's a lot there. And uh, and I love the title of the session with empathetic entrepreneurship, since I have a quote in my book, and it says that uh, empathy is the undervalued stock that enables those who have it to be more successful in many areas than those who lack it. So very relevant in today's times, especially as we're coming out of the pandemic and uh, very excited to be here. Thank you. All right, Dylan, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for having me here today. My name is Dylan Jiri. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, and I founded a business in 2007 that does work in the live event space, predominantly with working with a lot of technicians, high staff turnover, and since then have evolved myself into furthering my studies in strategy, coaching, and really helping people understand emotional intelligence better. Um, I am what I call a distracted entrepreneur, which means I like to get things going and then move on to the next thing. Uh, I, I felt that I needed to become an entrepreneur because school was challenging for me. I got 5% for maths in my final year and wasn't able to go to university. But in 2018, I was fortunate enough to finally make it to Harvard Business School, where I studied entrepreneurial strategy and the following year became a accredited strategy summit facilitator. And I've been working with people all around the world since then, helping them set strategy in their business and um, helping them become leaders who empower the people in their business to become the best versions of themselves, which then allows business owners to step out of their businesses and work on it from a top-down approach rather than getting stuck in the operational side of business. So I'm very happy to be with you guys here today. Why am I here and why is this session important to me? Well, I myself have struggled with many mental health challenges. And I think that's that that sounds so shocking, you know, but but mental health is very broad. I particularly struggled a lot with anxiety. Um, I had my DNA sequenced in 2019, and I have the IL1RN gene, which makes you more um, susceptible to depression. And through a lot of self-work, I have learned to realize that being positive and having an upbeat mindset um, takes a lot of daily work and daily habits. And although my friends are always shocked when I tell them that, uh, you know, I, I have to do all this work to, to sort of make sure that I'm mentally in the right gear to face the world, they're like, that's so strange because you're always so positive and you always have such an upbeat mindset. And so I'm really hoping to share some of that and why it's important to you. I also am on a mission to live a life without fear. And uh, that has really changed 
changed my life considerably, um, knowing that everything is going to be okay, no matter which direction it goes. So thank you for having me today. I look forward to engaging with all of you. Thank you so much, Salima and Dylan. Um, so many questions I already have for you and your friends of mine. So thanks for that great intro. Uh, Dylan, I thought we could get started with the icebreaker. Are we ready to go? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks very much for allowing me this opportunity to do an icebreaker. For me, uh, there's a couple of reasons to do this. I think we should all continue to, um, to develop our our virtual event or virtual capabilities, everyone, whether it's become part of our daily lives and even, even though event, in-person events are back in place, I think that virtual is here to stay. I think also that with a topic as, as deep as, as empathetic entrepreneurship, it's important for us to also get to know everyone in the room. So I want us to do an exercise together. And I really want to invite everyone to turn their cameras on right now. So don't worry, no one's going to have to say anything. No one's going to have to speak. But I really want to invite everyone to turn their cameras on. We can have everyone turn their cameras on. Hopefully we have some people turning their cameras on. There we go. Thank you, Elsie. And what we're going to do is I really just want us, we're a group of people that have never met each other. And I really want us to see if we can, in two or three minutes, get to have a more empathetic understanding and get to know people a little bit better through just a series of questions that I'm going to ask and I, we're going to answer via our cameras. So I want you guys to pick up a piece of paper. Um, it's always better if it's a colored piece of paper because it makes the screen look really beautiful. And again, if you've just joined, I'm going to invite everyone to, uh, to turn their cameras on and then block your camera with a piece of paper that is, uh, that you have on your desk. All right. If you want to leave your video off, that's fine. There is another option. You can use the raise hand functionality if it applies to you. I always like to do this seeing people's faces because it gets us to have a better connection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a couple of questions and I want you to, if that question is relevant to you, so if I ask you, do you prefer cats over dogs? If it's a yes for you, all I want you to do is click the raise hand button or remove the colored piece of paper. And over a series of questions, we will all get to know each other a little bit better. So for those people that don't want to turn on their cameras, if you can all just click your, your raise hand emoji uh, or any of the emojis, uh, you can click the heart emoji, any of those, just so that I know that you can hear us and that you can see us. Otherwise, we can start now. So let's cover up our let's cover up our screens all right everyone cover up your screen with a colored piece of paper and we're going to start with really a couple of really easy questions so the first one is do you have a tattoo do you have a tattoo if you have any tattoos click the raise your hand functionality or take away the piece of paper all right, thank you very much. All right, let's reset and go to the next question. Were you born before the 1980s? Were you born before the 1980s? Okay, thank you. Let's reset again. Were you born after the 1980s? Born after the 1980s. Okay. Lots more action there. All right, let's reset again. Um, another easy one, and then we'll take it one level deeper. Have you traveled or visited more than four continents? Have you traveled or visited more than four continents? Okay, we're seeing our travelers here. Thank you very much for sharing so far. Let's take it one level deeper. Have you ever been, so everyone just cover up again. Those that have raised their hands, drop your hands, cover up. Have you ever been arrested? Have you ever been arrested? All right. Thank you very much for sharing. All right. Next one. 
Are you COVID vaccinated? Are you COVID vaccinated? All right. Thank you for the participation. I really appreciate everyone sharing. We're slowly starting to build a safe space and we're slowly starting to get to know each other a little bit better. Okay, here comes the next one. Let's reset, cover up our cameras again. Have you ever fallen in love at first sight? Have you ever fallen in love at first sight? All right, some smiles there. And I hope some great memories coming back there. All right, fantastic. All right, we're almost halfway through. I want to ask a couple more questions. Let's reset and cover up our cameras again. Do you get irritated when helping old people with technology? Do you get irritated when helping old people with technology? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's reset again and go one level deeper. This is the last round of questions. Are you currently experiencing grief? Are you currently experiencing grief? All right. Thank you very much for sharing that. All right, let's reset and lower our hands. Have you ever been a victim of abuse? Have you ever been a victim of abuse? Thank you so much for sharing. All right, let's lower our hands again. Have you ever felt guilt as a spouse? Have you ever felt guilt as a spouse? Thank you. All right. And last question. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's reset. Are you curious to become a more aware person? Are you curious to become a more aware person? All right. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And I hope that uh, you've gotten to meet a couple of people, even though we haven't seen everyone's faces. I definitely have a better idea and I feel slightly more connected with everyone on this call. Safia, back to you. Wow. I need a second to inhale and exhale. So if everybody wants to just take in what we experienced um, and just kind of enjoy the what a beautiful intimacy that created in such a short time frame, and just exhale out so that you can come back present to the room. Thank you so much, Dylan. That was very powerful. Okay. It's my pleasure. Getting back into statistics and information to support the self-awareness piece, which it sounds like everybody wants to be a part of. If I could ask Parita to please put up slide three for us. Um, we're moving on to why well-being is becoming a priority in the workplace. So the, here we go. Let me just minimize my screen. So the great resignation, quiet quitting, anti-hustle, what do they all have in common? A recognition that behind the work that we do, there is still a person who requires more than just treating their work as a reward. When your work feels like a transaction that doesn't connect to your deeper sense of self, so this would be your freedom of curiosity, exploration, connection, values, and purpose, employees will burn out from being treated like a means to an end. I'm sure you felt this way in your own career. And so this is a reminder in this session that we are all human first, and that is the thesis, actually, of empathetic leadership. So the slide on here is for you to take a snapshot of. You, um, you can read it while I'm going through it. I will touch upon this, but you'll see why they become relevant. Um, and I really highlighted for you there, though, what the kind of key message is from each of them. We have issues of climate change, issues of war, oppression, the global pandemic. So beyond their obvious effects, these situations have taken a brutal toll on well-being. And for the younger generation, the impact is, is particularly stark. And that's something that we should all care about because we are living in a majority youthful world at this point in time. A recent survey reported that 52%, that's the majority of young adults, are experiencing feelings of depression or hopelessness. How do we achieve well-being in a world so overrun with crisis? 
One of the answers across generation has been quit your day job. Over the past two years, almost every industry has been impacted by the great resignation. Younger workers in lower paying industries, such as retail, food services, and healthcare, started the trend, and they were eventually joined by long tenured, higher paid employees from industries such as finance and technology. This phenomenon has prompted many companies to take a second look at burnout and well being. According to the University of California, Berkeley, a, a psychologist there who did some of the earliest research on the topic, burnout occurs when emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a reduced sense of personal accomplishment are all present simultaneously. In the words of your average worker, it's the result of being overworked and undervalued, as well as disconnected from a feeling that your job is actually important. While companies have turned to mindfulness rooms and unlimited time off as a way to combat the issue, which in my point of view, are just tactics to calm employees instead of addressing the key issues that are actually re require the calming in the first place. Neither is shaping up to be a long-term solution. The Great Place to Work Institute recently partnered with John Hopkins to study the well-being of more than 14,000 employees from 37 countries. What they found is that across people, places, and cultures, factors like personal support, a sense of purpose, and meaningful connections made the biggest difference to employees' health and happiness. If we could move to slide four, I just wanted you to take a look at this because there's actually five dimensions. Um, I'll just wait for that slide to shift. But there's actually five dimensions of employee well being. And what the findings found is that personal support, a sense of purpose, and meaningful connection made a bigger difference. Parita, are we able to move to the next slide by any chance? Thank you so much. And so what's interesting about this, if you actually look at the slide, we spend a lot more time often on the mental and emotional support piece and financial health. So a lot of bandage solutions. And what we're hearing now is that if we actually deal with the root issues um, that create a sense of, con of connection in the workplace, we may not actually have to spend so much other time on the other two dimensions. So that might be one of the biggest uh, gifts of the great resignation. The conversation it has sparked around purpose, engagement, and organizational values. Surprised that so many workers were willing to sacrifice financial stability for more fulfilling work, many firms have been forced to ask, what can I do better? This is especially true as we learn that the majority of those who left their jobs don't regret doing so. A Harris Poll survey from March indicated that only one in five, one in five workers who quit a job in the past two years would make a different choice today. A better quality of life has left most with absolutely no desire to turn back the clock on their decision. The Washington Post followed up by interviewing some resignees late last year. While they were concerned with the current state of the economy, the vast majority are thrilled, quote, with the changes they've made to their work lives. The testimonials speak volumes to the importance of well-being. Quote, I may make half as much, but I feel like twice the person, said a former New York City chef who went on to get certified, certified as a substance abuse counselor. Another quote, um, sorry, my screen keeps getting bigger. So in another quote, the stock market wiped out the equivalent of one year of my pension and I still have no regrets. The improvement in my personal happiness is priceless. This is from a former teacher in Florida who lost 10% of her pension by not waiting longer to retire. These testimonials illustrate something very important. Money doesn't drive retention. So according to the Great Place to Work, um, employees who experience high levels of well-being in the workplace are three times more likely to stick around. Being happy and healthy matters immensely. And for companies that understand this, purpose remains the vital lever. After all, people who say they are living their purpose report levels of well-being five times higher. That's huge. Five times higher than those who say that they aren't. Connect employees to the value of their work and the challenges they face might not seem so daunting. So personally, being a coach who supports emotional freedom and purpose in my own practice over the past 10 years, whether I am coaching a C-level executive or someone climbing in the professional chain, 100% of the time, that is no joke or exaggeration. There is a recognition that when your work is not connected to a deeper sense of self, the rewards of superficial success create more temporary feelings of fulfillment and begin encouraging questions of whether we are living in ways that make us truly alive. And when we start thinking about whether we're truly alive and awake and what we're doing, that starts to create a transition and transformation most of the time. 
Often, our work is actually a coping mechanism to hide from hard emotions we haven't fully recognized and dealt with. So from a trauma-informed approach, and if anybody has any questions on, on what trauma-informed work means, it will become much more popular, I think, in our daily jargon as we move forward. But um, a little bit of um, insight into some of the things that I deal with. So um, we have something we call high-level and low-level coping mechanisms. Your low-level coping mechanisms look like your traditional struggles, not that they should be traditional, but struggles like escaping from our realities through addiction to alcohol, to drugs. Um, but high-level coping can look like addiction to work. It can look like addiction to accolades, to getting degrees, to going to the gym. These are things that our society still rewards, but they're still coping. So the pandemic has forced us to take a deeper look at our lives and how we are living them in ways that weren't sustainable to our long-term fulfillment, and with more recognition of how current employment systems aren't set up to address the emotional and personal freedoms we desire, the systems are now being forced to change. We need to start approaching ourselves, our teams, and our clients from a perspective of how they best contribute to the systems of our organization and reward them in ways that are meaningful. This includes viewing whole organizations built by whole humans and not just the roles that they play, especially when they spend the majority of their time thinking about completing and being at work. Okay, there was a lot in there. Um, and there is a slide up right now. Those are the three dimensions that were the most significant to employee well being. Um, but what we're going to do now is move on to prioritizing our personal well being. And we will be using the slide um, to help us with one of the polling questions. So hopefully we can keep it up there. Um, but Parita, I would like us to launch our first polling question. So I hope everybody um, knows, firstly, that this is an anonymous, the uh, answers are anonymous. Um, but they are about you. So get comfortable. And your first question is, on a scale of one to five, how would you rate your overall satisfaction with your mental and emotional health? So your personal well-being. One equals extremely unsatisfied and five equals extremely satisfied. Please answer now. Really interesting. So there's 22 of us in the room. If hopefully all 22 of us can vote, we can get a real good feel of who's in the room and how everyone's feeling. How do you feel about your mental and emotional health at this moment in time? Okay, we've got about half the room who's answered. Give it another 30 seconds. All right. Should we end the poll? We'll give it one more, maybe wait about 10 more seconds if anybody else wants to vote. Otherwise, we'll end the poll. Get your answers in there. Remember, they're anonymous. Okay, let's end it. So if we can see the findings, all right. So the majority was at four, interesting. And then the next was at three. This is very, very um, parallel to what I usually see in most rooms. Um, so it just goes to show you that uh, we're never quite at a five and quite at a one, but we're usually somewhere in between. And there are various factors that will um, fluctuate this depending on what's happening on a daily basis. And so actually, it's a perfect segue to our next polling question. But if anybody wants to take a snapshot of this, by the way, this is not proprietary. Feel free to use this. You can take a snapshot. Otherwise, uh, we can stop sharing that one and move on to the second polling question. All right, polling question number two. On a scale of one to five, how much of an impact does your work have on your personal well being? So now this is how does your work impact your personal well being? There's no impact, use a one. If there's high impact, vote five. Okay, I'm seeing these results coming in a lot faster. Feels like it might be really relevant to our audience. <laughs> We have about 60% have voted. All right, so how is your work taking a toll on your personal well-being? High impact is a five. A 
about 10 more seconds to get the rest of the votes in. If we can have those remaining seven people, please vote and get a good view of how we're feeling. Okay, let's end the poll there. All right. And the results are in. The majority are on the higher end of the spectrum, which is interesting. So we have many people who are feeling like their work um, life is contributing to how they're feeling on a daily basis. Um, and one of the parallels that I wanted to draw here is that often, and this is what we were talking about um, through just why mental health is becoming more of a priority or your well-being is, um, because quite literally, you know, we're, we're hearing about burnout, we're hearing about resignation, we're hearing about quitting, um, but people aren't having these conversations. And a lot of the um, uh, ways that we're now addressing these issues in the workplace are very much bandaged solutions, right? Um, we have, uh, you know, mental health awareness weeks, we have events, we have, you know, a day off to be able to deal with um, the things that um, matter to you. But, you know, if we can actually shift uh, the way that the environment is supporting your mental health. And that means any environment, not just your workplace, but any environment, we can actually start mitigating the risk to actually feeling some of the, the ways that we are. And so this just goes to show that um, for many of you, whether you're entrepreneurs, whether you're investors, whether you're accelerators, you still work within an organization and your work still impacts how you're feeling on a daily basis. And if this is relevant to you, it's definitely re relevant to the many communities that you are connected to. All right, our last polling question. So this is associated to the slide that is up and it's based on the three dimensions that were uh, mentioned uh, in the research uh, around uh, you know, the top three that contribute to employee well-being. So of the top three dimensions contributing to employee well-being, which factor makes the biggest difference to your health and happiness at work? So is it personal support? Is it a sense of purpose or is it meaningful connection? Personal support, a sense of uh, purpose or meaningful connections. Which one is the most relevant to your health and happiness at work? And think about your most recent experience. You know, what's really been weighing on you. It can kind of, can, it can be parallel to the last question. Um, we're always moving in time. So how you're feeling at the moment, what's relevant to you at the moment. Okay. We have about 50 votes in. We can get a couple of more. We can get a really great view of how everyone is feeling. So what's relevant to you? Meaningful connection, personal support, sense of purpose. I'll give about 10 more seconds. Might be thinking through. Okay, we can end the poll there. All right. And so not surprising. I assumed this is what the answers would look like. Uh, a sense of purpose. We are in an entrepreneurship forum. Most of you are likely doing something you truly care about or are passionate about. So sense of purpose definitely aligns with that um, feeling every day that your work is meaningful and fulfilling um, because it actually aligns with your values. And so uh, great to hear that many of you um, uh, care about that and want to continue to um, support that factor of well-being in your workplace. All right, we can stop sharing the polls. Um, thank you for sharing the results and so much for your help, Parita. I so appreciate it. And now... Without further ado, my favorite part of today is we are going to move on to our speaker stories. Um, and this is what I call well-being wisdom, because for me, knowledge and wisdom, different things. We can learn things in school. We can hear about how experiences have affected people. But when we truly have experienced it and have had to learn how to deal with something, that is where all the wisdom comes in. So what greater way than to share um, from a personal perspective from two of my uh, friends, but also really accomplished entrepreneurs, uh, both Salima and Dylan. And so uh, I'm going to hand it over to Salima um, to share. And our speakers are really going to go in today uh, to talk about, you know, the topic of well-being from their personal perspective as entrepreneurs and share their journey and lessons. And for those of you who have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We will address them. There'll be an opportunity for Q&A. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing that. All right. Over to you, to Salima. Awesome. Thank you so much, Safia. So 
my story actually goes back to, let's say 2009, when I graduated from college and from McGill University, and I couldn't find a job in the economic crisis. I stayed in an attic in the Bronx, in New York City, I, I tried looking everywhere and couldn't find a job. And so I ended up deciding to figure out how I can, how can I, how can I provide more value? How can I do something good for the world if I couldn't find a job? So I decided to volunteer. And uh, that took me to Brazil to volunteer at an orphanage. However, I didn't end up at the orphanage immediately. What happened was that the, the, the nonprofit director was like, well, Salima, I want you to be in Rio de Janeiro and start a language school to help support the orphanage because we're struggling here. Our infrastructure is falling apart. We don't have long-term volunteers. We need more money. Uh, if you can start this language school, we'll give you the resources, we have a donor and uh, just, just get it up and running. And so that way the proceeds from the school can support the orphanage. And so in Rio de Janeiro, I didn't speak much uh, Portuguese. I was speaking Portuguese and uh, got the school started, got a bunch of volunteers from around the world together. Didn't know what I was doing at age 21, but but managed to make it happen. And we were teaching all these different languages um, you know, as volunteers and realized that our business model was failing because uh, that wasn't the best strategy. We would have classes that sometimes only had one person or people weren't showing up. Then we pivoted, which is such an important process. And mental health is in a really, really key in that pivoting process as an entrepreneur. It's tough uh, to accept that we were failing, but that also means that that challenge is an opportunity for reinvention. We ended up focusing on what we were good at, where we did have traction was, you know, Portuguese for foreigners. We had the foreign students that were really, really interested in learning Portuguese and also supporting the orphanage. And uh, and that's when our business model shifted and took off. And we were able to start academic credit programs, homestays, extracurricular activities, um, all kinds of partnerships with Lonely Planet, et cetera. And, and the school became uh, the top rated school in Rio de Janeiro, uh, still exists today, became a for-profit actually from a nonprofit and uh, has a whole community. And that was a defining experience that really set the foundation for entrepreneurship in the very early stages of my career. I then ended up moving to Italy from Brazil. Uh, love story there. It's in my book. But <laughs> I ended up uh, living in the south of Italy in a town called Reggio di Calabria, which is right across from Sicily. There is the mafia. There were bombs. It was a kind of crazy place to live. But no jobs. Again, 2009, I was now uh, you know, turning 22 and uh, just couldn't, couldn't find a job. I tried uh, cooking Italian food, but they didn't eat Caesar salad and fettuccine Alfredo there. I tried uh, teaching English, but I didn't have a British accent. And after tons of rejection, I ended up uh, fueling that into, into what can I do? And I went to the internet. My brother gave me some advice. Why don't you set up a profile on elance.com and start using your skills like languages since I spoke some languages and could do translation work. I couldn't use my degree in international development. And I ended up uh, starting it turned into a from a freelance trans translation, you know, small gigs here and there turn into a six figure translation business within just a few months to help businesses go global and help them translate their websites, we could work in HTML, uh, we couldn't even afford translation software. So what we did instead was, uh, and this is my, my partner and I were doing this together. Uh, we we actually had human translators because the gig economy was just starting up. And so there were a lot of people that were sitting around the world also without a job and available to do translation work. And so that business really took off and did well and um, was able to exit and sell the business a few years later. Uh, I wanted to actually, it wasn't trying to be an entrepreneur. I actually, my dream was to work at um, the World Bank or the Inter-American Development Bank and pursue a career in international development. So I went to grad school at Johns Hopkins in Bologna, Italy, moved back to Brazil to do some work at the China Brazil Business Council, ended up in Washington, D.C. to finish graduate school here at Johns Hopkins. And after graduating, I had gotten this uh, dream job or what I thought was a dream job at the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, working in economic development and studied economics and, and, you know, was traveling around Latin America, advising governments and uh, monitoring and evaluating projects and visiting different sites and fields. And it was a whole different experience. And, and it was, I learned a lot and it was exciting, but I also didn't feel that I was able to have the flexibility and creativity. I felt I was put into a box and often said no to, and I, I couldn't really be my true self, nor could I, nor I, and I missed that, that life as an entrepreneur, which I didn't have the perspective pri prior, but after having those different experiences, I really started to appreciate 
uh, the entrepreneurial lifestyle and being able to to, to wake up excited and uh, do something I love. I ended up uh, exiting that job three years later and going back into entrepreneurship. And through actually storytelling and telling, I started, I was very embarrassed about my translation business because it wasn't really anything that my colleagues or my classmates um, really you know, understood or, or did. And, and I was embarrassed. It was really just myself telling a story in my head which I also learned about through um, a, my therapist that, you know, sometimes we tell stories in our heads that aren't really true. And as an entrepreneur, it's so important to be vulnerable and share. And, um, and it was actually when I started sharing my story that a lot of opportunities started coming to me. And that's when I landed uh, a job, a side hustle with, with uh, Elance after telling my story and success with the translation business. Uh, they hired me. Now they're called Upwork. If many of you probably know this freelancing platform and they were like, we want you to tell your story to entrepreneurs and go around and launch different WeWorks. Um, you know, we work the co-working space and, uh, and, and teach entrepreneurs how to hire remote teams. Of course, in 2013, 2014, and even 2015, remote teams wasn't, wasn't a huge thing. And so uh, our startup education program failed. Uh, it was also a time when after making that exit, I had co-founded a marketing agency and that was also a failed experience when I got laid off from both those jobs. And so I now had made this big career transition out of international development into entrepreneurship, but I couldn't figure out how do I unleash that entrepreneur within myself? How do I actually do that and be successful again? I no longer was in the crisis I was in back in 2009, but I was I was struggling to figure out how do I start again? And, and if I'm so good at helping other entrepreneurs get started, how come I can't do that to myself? And it was interesting. A lot of other things happened that year. This very home that I'd recently got at the time had a bad fire. The building burned down and I was displaced for, for almost nine months. Um, got laid off from those two jobs. I had gotten divorced. There were so many, so many traumatic experiences that happened to me within that period of time. I ended up uh, booking a one-way trip to India. Uh, I spent a month there uh, doing a lot of meditation, yoga, Ayurveda, ended up later in Thailand and Bali, trying to really heal myself and, and understand what is my purpose? Who am I going to become? It's not Salima in international development, but Salima as an entrepreneur is failing. What am I going to do? Came back to Washington, D.C. Actually got rejected at Toronto Pearson Airport. I couldn't get back into the States. I'm actually Canadian and uh, had struggles trying to get the visa to come back here. They let me in for two weeks as a tourist. And this is, you know, I had my home here, couldn't access it. But I ended up, um, yeah, going on this, what I call 100 coffee challenge and literally had two weeks to find a job with a visa. And so I was strategic and had coffee all over Washington, D.C., asking people for help. And it was really hard being vulnerable and asking people for help. But I realized that people were actually willing to help. And I landed two opportunities, one which I ended up taking was to help, uh, you know, figure out how to solve this food insecurity problem in Africa and the Middle East using hydroponics and different ways of growing food without using soil and very little water, which I ended up taking, which led to so many other opportunities. Uh, but yeah, that was a really, really hard time of my life when I realized the importance of mental health and, and being able to take care of ourselves, but also having the right support system or what I call solidarity squad in place, um, having therapy, having a coach, having uh, you know, a circle of friends, having um, you know support groups where I could share uh, even before that life quake happened was so important because I never really had that mental health support throughout my life you know my family never really had uh, I'd experienced trauma earlier in my life and my mother passed away at the age of 16 I never had a therapist until the age of 28 or 29 and so all of that healing that had to happen actually led me to unleash so much um, you know when I came back and was able to do that work in hydroponics I ended up you know, going into design thinking and innovation and starting another company. Um, and, and a few years later, was able to really identify, well, my dream is to help entrepreneurs. I want to help 10 million entrepreneurs succeed and grow their businesses. For a while, I was in that healing journey of three to four years. And personal development, is a, is a, it takes a while. It's not something you can just hire a coach, a therapist, and then uh, get healed within a couple months. It really takes a lot of self-awareness and deep work and a lot of really deep healing. And um, it's not just fixing or patching. It's it's a lot of rewiring or re, re, revisiting our lives and, and telling our stories in a different way. 
And I ended up, uh, you know, realizing during the pandemic, another crisis happened, I was able to (laughs) navigate this one a lot better. And uh, went back to well, if I did this in 2009, I can also do this in 2020. And um, accepted that my previous business was failing, which can be really hard knowing when to let go. Seth Godin has a great book on that called um, The Dip. And I realized it was time to let go of of my previous business and uh, start my current business, Ripple Impact, where I was like, well, there may there must be a way to help entrepreneurs and monetize it and be successful. And it was really through helping entrepreneurs, not just with coaching and advising them, but realizing that not they don't need to necessarily hire their own teams and um, they might not have all the strategy to do that. But also just helping them with coaching wasn't enough. They needed designers, they needed marketing, they needed They needed a lot of talent and they didn't know where to start. And it was the, you know, the chicken and egg problem most of us entrepreneurs deal with at the early stages. And it was then that I started Ripple Impact, uh, where we were able to bring together designers, marketers, strategists, and and a really awesome team. We were very small. We were two people two years ago, and we're now a team of almost 50 people, which is, it's great to see some of our team members here in the audience as well. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's what happened. It blew up. And now we're supporting uh, several, several entrepreneurs and we're the team behind the scenes, supporting them and helping them grow their businesses. And in that process, I also launched my book, as I mentioned earlier, Innovation Starts With I, which has uh, the story, has a lot of great tools and frameworks on really how to, reinvent not just your business but starting with yourself because business reinvention is is really all about personal reinvention and uh that's my story all right safia you happy for me to go fantastic so I think just thinking back on my life now, I think there's there were two main inflection points that I think really uh, started the process to me becoming and falling in love with empathy and and emotional intelligence. And the one was very young at age four, where I got a very rare skin disease called Empatiger. And it would, uh, it would start on my skin like a mosquito bite and it would open and open and open till it was like a festering welt. And some nights my mom would have to change my sheets because it was just so bad and there was so much fluid coming from these welts. And, um, and that caused, because no one knew a lot about the illness, mothers wouldn't want their kids to play with me. So I started feeling this loneliness and and I started to feel like there was maybe something wrong with me. And then later on um, in life, I I went, decided to make a decision to go from a Afrikaans primary school to an English high school. And, and I think as a teenager, that was quite a big decision because all my friends carried on to another school and I went to this new school. And again, I felt this loneliness having to reflect a lot inwardly, not knowing my space in the world. And um, I was very lucky to have an extremely supportive family, but I, I constantly wanted to understand more about these feelings. And um, I was then, I then moved like fast forward many experiences, but, but ultimately in 2007, I started a business with very little cash flow and very big ambitions and also a, a high court lawsuit from my previous employer. And it was at this point where I was working 100-hour weeks. Um, I already had some staff, so I felt responsible for them. In our country, there are up to six dependents of each salary. And so this started building more and more anxiety. And, um, and, And I really was reflecting again, but trying to understand where was all this going? Because every th- the only thing I could do to, to solve the court case was make more sales and work harder. And so that led to a lot of anxiety. It led to definitely pre-burnout scenarios. And, um, and then I joined the Entrepreneurs Organization in 2012. And that really changed my life because for the first time, it brought together the sense that you are not a work person, you are not a social person, you are not a family person, you're all of these people in one. And how do you take care of this person as one? And how do you also see how you impact others through what you do? And and sort of through this process of sharing experiences with other entrepreneurs, I started to realize that people are not inherently bad. People are inherently looking after themselves first 
And sometimes we become collateral damage because of that. And so my curiosity around understanding people more and more became bigger and bigger and bigger. And I then started to realize in my business, if I really wanted to make it work, I really needed to empower people. We, um, and I needed to empower them not just to realize their growth potential in the business, but to realize their growth potential in their entire life. And in an industry where we have massively high staff turnover, we were able to build a culture that really sort of cared for each other and cared for the person within the company and try to understand how that person thinks, feels and acts and shows up in the world and what is their route to success? You know, we were all bound by a great vision and mission and values, but each of us, I started realizing, had a different way to getting there. And so my studies continued as well. I started studying the Enneagram. I became a team dynamics e uh, expert through my own healing process. I started to learn a lot about breath work, about mindfulness, about journaling, and I started passing that on to my staff and seeing how much growth they would get from that. And um, that really helped define my purpose in many of the other businesses that I've since started up to live my purpose, which is I'm the breath that connects humans to leap into their highest self. And when I get that right in the companies that I, that I create or that I work with, then operationally, the business starts operating on such a high level that I can then focus on culture and strategy, which have become my, my passions. And so it's, it's just, you know, Sadhguru has this amazing bit of wisdom where he says, you've got two choices in life. You can either be wounded or you can, you can learn from those wounds and become wise. And so my number one value in life is curiosity and just to keep meeting people and keep impacting people's lives in a way where I can help them transition from their wounds to wisdom and then unlocking their potential in life. That's a quick summary of my story. Wow. I feel like in one hour, we've covered so much, um, but it's just such valuable information. Firstly, Salima, thank you so much for taking me on a journey of, of your exploration into where you um, started to where you are now. That was, I haven't gone on the journey with you before. So that was really insightful. Um, and Dylan, um, you know, firstly, I love Sadhguru. So I love that we definitely resonate on the same philosophies. Um, but also, you know, the both of you were so... Um, you were so vulnerable. And what I really heard come out of your stories is the fact that so much of your personal experience as a human being, the things that you go through, the things that you don't have control over um, are also the parts that made you the successful entrepreneurs that you are today. If it wasn't without those trials and tribulations as a being, not just an entrepreneur, you actually wouldn't be um, the successful, like the, the high impact entrepreneurs that you are. So um Thank you for bringing all of yourself to the conversation today. Now, we have about seven minutes left, and I think um, the best use of our time would really to be get to the Q&A. So, um, Parita, how would you best like to um, support I you? think she has a question for you. Extremely sorry for that. I can oh. read out the questions for y'all. And uh, I think uh, we have questions I slightly directed to a few of y'all, so we can also get through that. Mm. Uh, I think very firstly, we had something uh, for um, Salima coming mm. in. Um, Salima, uh, how have you brought empathy into your company and made it a foundational value, considering it's both global and remote? Um, and you have to deal with so many different cultures. Uh, but you've still managed to support every individual in a unique way. And uh, Cheyenne speaks from personal experience, so would love some anecdotes here. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, so I actually have a whole chapter on empathy in my book, and there's lots of tools on like what empathy is, what it's not, and there's a lot of great stuff in there. But what I can say from our experience is that uh, really trying to connect with our team members on a on a human level, uh, at the end of the day, we're humans. And uh, when I interviewed Ariana Huffington for my book, we talked a lot about 
work-life integration. I think work-life balance is a thing of the past, but she really emphasized the importance of work-life integration. Since as entrepreneurs, uh, it's hard to have boundaries because we really love what we do. For me, my mission is to help entrepreneurs as a personal mission. And that comes out in my work that's executed through my work. And so when our life purpose is integrated into our business, it can be really tough to, to, to set those boundaries. And so I think that in the past, we said we had to have these really strict boundaries, but today that everything is sort of melded, we're working from home. Um, sure, it is important to have certain boundaries, but I also think that um, we we don't we can really learn how to invite our team members to bring their whole selves to work because at the end of the day, people you want people to feel that they're connected to to the mission, that they're co-creating the vision with you. And it's not just the founder with the vision and people just below them executing, but rather we're all together, very horizontally, very flat. I like to say our team's very, very, uh, very flat. And um, we, we, we generally are working together towards the same mission. And uh, there's a way to, to really um, connect your team members to feel intrinsically motivated by helping them, you know, kind of like running, we kind of run like a bunch of small startups within Ripple Impact since we're now a medium sized business almost and um, we're no longer a startup, but we do have different departments, which we give them the autonomy and the creativity and flexibility to, to create uh, their own mini culture and their own, you know, have their budget, have uh, the ability to, to organize their own events and things. And we're also trying to move from an entirely remote team to a hybrid team. Uh, we've done some trips, we've done some, you know, uh, retreats and, and uh, regional retreats. Uh, we're hopefully going to have a global retreat very soon to bring everyone together. Uh, we've had, you know, book tours. I've had even Cheyenne here has come and I've met her in Dubai on a book tour. Um, and it's it's been amazing to meet people in person. But I think we want to figure out how can we make that more of a practice where we can bring people together. Uh, we may not have physical offices, but how can we use that, um, that extra budget towards bringing everyone together, even if it's just once or twice a year. And I think that goes a very long way. It changes the connection we have with each other when we get to know each other in person. And if that's not possible, there's ways to do team building virtually. It's just having some people dedicate uh, time towards, uh, you know, whether it's fun Fridays, doing things as a team, exercising, yoga, meditation, um, uh, cooking workshops, whatever it is, but really trying to connect with people on a human level is, is so key um, so that they all feel included and that we're part of something bigger. Yeah, Salima, thank you so much. I just wanted to really bring home the idea of work-life integration and what that means. We all belong to various communities in our lives. And I think that when we take the approach with our organizations and we treat people as if we're doing events or we're putting things in place to create a, a work life balance or, you know, making people feel like they're included. When it comes from a feeling of, I, I have to do this, it doesn't really work. You're, the community that you build at work is the community, it's a, like a community of friends, even with my clients, as much as, you know, um, I'm a coach, there's certain, I, I call them, you know, the community I'm meant to serve, they become a part of my community. And so if I don't treat them um, you know, with the approach of like, you matter and what matters to you matters to me as well. And how do we create a system where all of us feel like we are a part of something that matters, then um, all we're really doing is, is kind of um, creating these systems to try to check something off a box and that never really works. So I love this idea of integration as opposed to balance, because your work is pretty much so much of your life. Now we don't have boundaries at work after the pandemic, people have really not thought about that. So we have to integrate. So thanks for, for sharing that. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I think Salima and Safiya, and we have a lot of more questions coming in, but in the interest of time, I'm going to take one more uh, and, and we'll, we'll redirect these questions that you weren't able to answer later. Uh, we have a question uh, from Julius. He says that uh, I work with an organization in Uganda called Nafida Network Foundation with teenage mothers. Some of these teenage mothers have mental health problems. How can they get help? I think let's take that one offline. Um, that would require a little bit more digging. Um, but I think you had one more question, Parita, at the beginning around anxiety, right? Um, yes. Could we direct yeah. that to Dylan? Sure. Uh, Dylan, we have a question of how uh, from Kevin. Of how can he overcome anxiety as a young entrepreneur who runs a startup company? Fantastic. Thank you very much for asking the question. And I think that it's important to understand that Anxieties in all of us, and and it's not necessarily always a bad thing. You know, I, I I think back to being a kid and the night before Christmas, 
and you have that anxiety of tomorrow's Christmas. I wonder what presents I'm going to get. And our bodies struggle to differentiate between good anxiety and bad anxiety. And it took me many years to learn actually about polarity and, and how polarity is a universal law of nature. And, you know, if, if, if I constantly am, am, am building something with loads and loads of excitement, then I fail to see what the cost is of that. And so let me explain that a little bit better. So let's say I just landed a massive contract and I'm an exuberant person. I'm super excited. I'm happy. I'm like got all this good energy in me. What I try to do now and what I didn't do in the past is I try and balance it out by saying, what is the cost of this? Okay, so I've got this great contract. It's amazing for all the reasons that a good contract could be amazing. But now I'm going to have to work more hours. I'm going to have to travel more. I'm not going to see my family as much. I'm not going to see my friends as much. And so slowly that starts bringing everything back into perspective. And um, and that's really helped me to deal with anxiety. The other thing that's always that's also helped me is um, Alan Watts has a, has a philosophy that says, as humans, we have no real understanding that whether a decision we make today is going to be good or bad for us in the future, and whether a result is going to be good or bad for us in the future. So once I started learning that, and I learned to remove fear from decisions, you can really actually almost roll a dice. And, and if you are open enough to learning and open enough to healing, you can off every decision have the opportunity to learn and grow, whether that outcome is perceived by you to be good or bad, or it's perceived by the world to be good or bad. And um, along with that, I think in the early days, the things that really helped me was breath work. I struggled to, to do meditations. It was really hard for me to do meditations. Breath work really helped me a lot. I learned that as humans, we breathe way too shallow nowadays. So working on my breath work helped a lot. Journaling helped me a lot. And, and doing positive journaling every day. Gratitude journaling. What are three things that I'm grateful for? What is one big thing that I'm going to set out to achieve today? And getting all of that stuff on paper declutters your mind. And that also helped me to deal with anxiety. Thank you so much, Dylan. Karita, if I can have two minutes, I just wanted to close off, but also respond to what Dylan said. You know, it's funny when I was looking at that question, the first thing I said is attachment to expectations, right? If we're always thinking about the future and trying, and, and, and as, as, as an entrepreneur, and I work with many, um, you know, of course, you know, there's fears about, uh, will I make payroll this month, right? Um, are we going to make our growth objectives? Uh, like, you know, you're, you have so many stresses on you, but if you're so focused, and attached to the outcome in the future and you can't be present, you're not even able to take the next possible step that could get you towards that future goal. And so often what I say to clients is the only thing you have control over is the next step that you take in the direction of that and if you are, if you can find a way to be present in that, and, and you will always flow forward in the way that you're meant to. And honestly, every single entrepreneur you ever speak to, there is always going to be a story where things felt like they were falling apart. But often, it's in things falling apart that we actually rebuilt and actually found a way that was better than we even thought. We think we're geniuses sometimes, and we have all the solutions, and often solutions find us in the hardest of times. So thank you for sharing that. I also want people to be aware there's a lot of science around how your emotions are stuck in your body. And so the idea behind breath work, right? Um, the, 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 we are uh, constantly um, moving um, energy and either that energy gets released or it gets stored in you. And so if you are feeling, uh, you know, uh, issues in your gut, right? If you're noticing you're breathing heavily, if your heart's beating uh, very fast, if your palms are getting sweaty, these are all emotions that are not getting expressed. So whether it's journaling, whether it's having a mentor at work, whether it's doing breath work, make sure that you have an outlet to literally the sponge of who you are, whether it's what you're taking in um, experiences, you're taking in um, um, what the food you're ingesting, whatever it is, your body must release that. So find avenues to do that. Um, and so thank you both so, so much. I can't wait to, to hear the feedback from today's session. I'm so grateful for all of you who attended and spent the time with us. We didn't get to the brainstorm, but I wanted you to walk away with uh, one exercise. Uh, in the polling, 
we uh, identified a sense of purpose as being the most important dimension to this group who attended today. I would love for all of you to be able to take home uh, with you um, just thinking about that dimension, why it's important to you, the why is really important. And what is one thing that you think you could start implementing today within your organization that could start really shifting the culture um, to really be more of a place of meaning, progress and fulfillment for not only you, but the community you belong to. Remember, when we're thinking about cultural shifts, we support quality of life. It's not just about a bandaged solution. It's about actually uh, walking the way that we're talking. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salima. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you to the whole Sam Kalp team. This has been such a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to meeting you all again.